Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is round four from the 41st Chess Olympiad 2014. On board one for Norway was world champion Magnus Carlsen, and he was paired with Poland's Radoslav Wojtaszek. Let's have a look at it. Carlsen opened with e4, Wojtaszek playing the Sicilian defense. Knight c3, the closed system. d6, g3, both sides will fianchetto their king bishops. Knight c6, d3, and bishop to e3. There's a few things to note regarding the bishop's placement on e3. For one, it's allowing white to form this battery along the c1 to h6 diagonal. White's in a position to exchange dark square bishops. The removal of this dark square bishop would weaken the black kingside castle position. f6, the squares f6 and h6 in particular. He's doing some more things, however. He's watching over d4, and maybe more importantly, keeping pressure on black's pawn structure, the c5 pawn. By having pressure on him, he will eventually influence how the pawn structure changes in this game. Okay, moving forward, we have e5. Black sets up a Bodvinik structure, having a grip over the d4 square. The one drawback, of course, is that d5 is now a hole, but the king knight will be the one who is responsible for watching over that sensitive point. Knight h3, knight to e7. This may seem like an awkward placement for the knight, developing it to the edge. One thing to bear in mind with the knight placements, the king knight placements, there's something similar between both. They are staying clear of the f-pawns. They want to be able to move because that's where we can have a structural change. But that's where we can have a pawn break. You might question, well, you could also play on the white side knight to e2 and you're also staying out of the way and you're not developing it to the edge. Well, this knight on h3 is more aggressively placed. This is one thing to keep in mind. He's more aggressively placed on h3 than e2. When he's on h3, he makes life maybe a little bit more awkward for the queen side bishop. This bishop would normally like to play to e3 to watch over the sensitive point d5, but that's not without worry of knight g5. And so if black really wants to play this move, he will probably have to invest a tempo with h6. Additionally, if the knight is on e2, white may very well be more welcome to more exchanges because as white you pretty much have to anticipate knight d4 and well we could be having the queen knight exchanged for the king knight maybe that's something white doesn't want in this game we don't end up having the queen knight and the king knight exchanged clearly the knight is much further away we do eventually see a knight land on d4 but keep in mind the d4 square is not a hole in the white position and so as a result, it can be kicked one day with c3. These are the corresponding squares in the center, d4 and d5. d4 is not a hole, but d5 is. Okay, knight e7, f4, knight d4, both sides castle, and queen to d2. Moving forward, bishop d7. White now has to be a bit cautious. I didn't point out any drawbacks yet regarding the knight on the edge. But with bishop d7, black is maybe looking to inconvenience white in some sense by playing queen to c8, throwing a question to the knight's placement. Will he be able to maintain the knight on h3? Well, white will be able to do that. He plays knight d1. A couple things in mind with this. For one, when queen c8 is played, there's knight f2, securing the knight's position. And white is also clearing the way to kick the knight out of the white position. So we do have that. Queen c8, knight f2, and now knight c6, which was a, a bit of a curious move for me to see, to voluntarily retreat the knight, in other words. Eventually it's going to be kicked, but I wonder, is it best to already just voluntarily go back or do something else? Like, maybe there are some lines where the knight actually has another option besides c6. 
Um, for example, if b6 is played and then c3, maybe the knight could play here. Maybe it's a new possibility. Uh, you might be, of course, running into some trouble with f5 since you're blocking the bishop. But I just wanted to highlight maybe it's maybe it's best to not yet commit the knight's position to either c6 or e6. I pointed out the move b6, but maybe there's even f6. Maybe this would be a little bit different, having the pawn there to watch over e5. Okay, but we don't have that. It is the knight voluntarily going back to c6, which is allowing white a moment to change the pawn structure. We're at move 13 here, an important point in the game. We could have a pawn structure change in the following way. F takes E, and because of the bishop having pressure on C5, there would be no D takes E. We would be dropping C5. And so by voluntarily retreating the knight, black is saying that they will be okay with this potential structural change. F takes E, knight takes E, and let's say ensuing moves like bishop here, and then F6 to watch out for knight G5 stuff. This is one way that the pawn structure can change. It didn't happen at this moment in the game, but rather one move later. Uh, in, if this were to occur, what do we have when we look at the pawn structure? We have now white with a majority, two pawns versus one. And what this essentially means is that white can get this type of pawn push in. He could have that ideal pawn center, d4 and e4 pawn structure in particular. Okay, we don't quite get there, at least not just yet. Instead of capturing this position, Carlson played c3. Okay, so there is still this idea of capture on e5 with then these follow-up moves because of the pressure on c5. After c3, we have b5, which is maybe a slight misstep on the black side. I don't know that this is something that black should have allowed, this structural change, which is what Carlson goes for right now. f takes e and now knight takes. Again, you cannot recapture with the pawn. You're dropping c5. So after f takes e, knight takes is played, and then we have the dark square bishops being exchanged. Now, if black did not want to go into this structural change, needed to come up with something different instead of b5. A better move might have might have been b6, or f6. If b6 or f6 are played, notice how when this capture is made, white is able to recapture here, open up this file, and still have a grip over the d4 square with two black pawns, and still have two versus two pawns in the center. However, comparing f6 and b6, I like the move b6 better because it allows this pawn still more options. Maybe it'll play to f6, maybe it'll have more aggressive intentions and play f5. Okay, so now with this, if b6 were played instead of b5 at move 13, if now we have this capture, well, now this pawn can recapture. He's defended, and black has a grip over this d4 square, and maybe not long off, there can be pressure on this d3 pawn. Okay, uh, these are important details in the position. As the pawn structure changes, the relative value of the pieces change. Okay, so after c3, it was not uh, the more secure type of move with b6 reinforcing the c5 pawn, but something uh, a little bit more lashing out, this b5 looking for b4 and some opening up of the queenside position. And so we do have this capture as the follow-up. F takes E, knight takes, bishop h6. The dark square bishops come off. Maybe slightly better on the black side would be, it's not always a good idea to do this, but to actually welcome the queen into your position and only then play f6, trying to get a grip over the dark squares. 
you won't be able to, as black, stop d4, but maybe you could uh, try to have some control over that next dark square moving one more rank up the board. That next dark square to have some control over is the e5 square. Uh, additionally, it might be a little bit awkward for this knight to get back into play. This queen is in the black position, but she probably will have to come back like so before playing the knight to f4. This knight pretty much wants to come in in this direction, knight f4 to d5 stuff, but if you do that too quickly, you're running into some trouble with knight f7 and the queen's in trouble. In fact, black is going to win some material. Queen h4 is the only reply, and then we have g5. So my point here is that it's not always a good idea to invite the queen into your position, but this f6 move is there to watch over knight g5 stuff, and eventually the queen's actually going to have to spend some time to come back to watch over these dark squares over here and facilitate a d4 advance. Okay, so we didn't have that. Black did not capture. Instead played knight c6. Bishop takes, king takes. Knight to f4. Okay, he's getting in a better position. Focusing on the weak point, d5. Queen to d8. Not quite sure the queen's position. I guess there is this potential to come out on b6. This is a weakened diagonal on the white side. There might be some, as indirect as it may be, there might be some future pin of a white pawn when placed on the d4 square. It's also vacating c8. The rook would like to play there. Anticipating the d4 move will have c takes and then c takes and a completely open c file. So rook a to d1, prepping this move. It will need support. I mean, it could be played right away, but it will eventually need support. If you do this right now, d4 takes, takes, knight c4. You have to watch over a couple pawns. This might be a little bit awkward to be uh, keeping a watchful eye over both pawns. So first, let's just get the queen rook doing something. Rook to d1. Rook to c8, and now queen to e2. This is an interesting move. You could go with d4 right away, um, but queen to e2 is threatening to play d4 and not allow this knight to exchange itself off so easily. The point I'm getting at here is that if d4 takes, takes, maybe this knight could play here and exchange itself off for the f2 knight. Keep in mind, white is the side who has more space, has a very nice center, and will be the one who is not so quick to make exchanges. Um, having this move queen to e2 played, however, first, is now threatening d4. Let me just make a passing move to highlight the idea here. After Carlson's queen to e2, if let's say the king just went here as a passing move, now comes d4. And where is this knight having to go? Well, he can't play here. You're just dropping a piece. So he has to go in this direction. And he could be kicked from there. And he has to go in this direction. Look at how sidelined the knight is. He's very offside and not around to secure the black kingside position, which is clearly without any minor pieces defending it. So black is addressing this idea at this very moment. When queen to e2 is played, black wants to be in a spot to exchange these knights. So h5 is played. And after d4, a couple exchanges, knight g4. Do we take the knight or what? Actually, if you take the knight, you're welcoming more exchanges. Bishop f3 would then be needed. So we are going to have the knights exchange, but let's not go any further and exchange more pieces. So it's h3, knight takes, queen takes. Already there should be some sense that there are tactics right around the corner. There are, uh, well, there's two major pieces on this f file. There's not long off a knight that can maybe get into f6. In fact, this is a very strong position for the knight and something that is addressed immediately by black. Knight to e7 watches over d5. Rook to d3, 
Black is looking to triple pieces on the F file. And the king side certainly will smell of tactics here. There's a lot of different ideas that could be possible. As soon as you have three pieces trained here, F7 becomes a super sensitive point. So let's see exactly how black copes with that. B4 is tried, looking to inconvenience the white rooks. Rook F3, and now queen to E8. They're needed. Black needed to have some defense of F7. Running for moves like bishop to b5 hitting the rook, well, unfortunately for black, white doesn't have to react to this threat. There's already this great amount of, uh, well, there's this potential energy in the position on the white side, on the king side here, where there are sacrifices in, involved with knight takes h5. If pawn takes knight, we're already looking at uh, mate and x, like mate, mate and sevens and such, king to g8. Queen f6, you get the idea. This is going to lead to mate. Rook takes, queen takes, king here. These types of moves. Mate is uh, happening in just a few moves. So, in other words, you can't play this. You need to defend f7. Otherwise, white will be crashing through. Queen, queen to e8. And now g4. Very nice pawn break. It's interesting to see how this... Uh, this move earlier was played so as to exchange uh, a pair of minor pieces, but we're seeing a way to take advantage of it as well. We can be striking at that point. After these two captures, what do we have? A new file to work with. And so ideas spring to mind, including rook h3, queen h4, looking for mate on the h file. This pawn on g4 is immune by the way. The move played in the game is bishop b5. If this pawn is taken, rook g3 would follow. And if you're playing something like queen to d7 to defend the bishop, there's bishop h3. And if bishop takes bishop, we have this cute move knight h5 and an eventual fork on f7 winning the queen. If you go to the corner, it's actually a mate in one, two. If you go to any of these two squares, that's the fork I'm talking about. If you play here, eventually you can force a fork with queen f4 and then knight to f6. So we don't go into that position. It's not bishop takes g4, but rather bishop b5. The rook is hit. Rook to e1. Notice these pawns here. There's... Always the potential when you have this pawn duo in the center. You can push with one pawn or the other. You could play in this position e5. Well, not in this very position, just in general. You have a pawn duo in the center. You have two different pawn moves you can make. There's, there's three things you could be doing. You could play e5. You could play d5. And the third thing, do nothing. And that's often the best thing. Just simply having them sit, control great amount of squares. So, after rook to e1, it was queen back home to d8. g5, f6 is in mind now. If the queen ever gets there, it's going to be big problems fast for black. There's really no saving this position on the black end. White is eventually going to crash through. Queen b6, bishop h3, and, well, okay, this rook is hit, and he can't go... Uh, he can't leave the defense of f8. It's a, a sad position right here, unfortunately, for black to have to go from being on a completely open file to one that is completely closed. But, yeah, he has to watch over this rook. Playing here allows knight checks. If pawn takes knight, we're crashing through. So the rook has to stick around to defend the rook, but now comes a very nice shot. Bishop to e6, and you can't see it in the video, but the evaluation is just going crazy. It's plus 9, and continues to climb with more thought by the engine. If pawn takes bishop, this is just brutal, leading to a mate in 3. This rook has hit a million times, and the king will be dead soon. So we don't have pawn takes bishop. Instead, black has to go in reverse, balled up here having to defend a pawn, unfortunately. And after knight d5, 
removing the knight. We have that little fork here. Knight takes, bishop takes. It's at this point that black simply resigns. There's just not going to be a good defense here in this position. The idea of even getting a queen here on f6 or some combination of rook h3, rook h4, rook h3 and queen h4 looking for mate on h7, there's just far too many threats. If let's say queen c7, there can be rook h3, and if the queen let's say comes over here to defend f6, I'm just going to highlight how bad this can really be for black. You could actually sack your rook. This is in no way best, but you don't even need this rook around to win the game. That's how strong this attack is. Queen h4, king here, queen h6. These pieces are doing absolutely nothing. This pawn can't move. All of these squares are guarded. And what exactly are you going to, are you going to do as black? The main threat here, one that you simply cannot even parry, is queen takes pawn. If the rook came over here, queen takes pawn with check, king here, queen h6, you don't even need this rook involved. g6, and how are you stopping queen h7 mate? You have to give up your queen. That's how strong this attack is. You don't even need a rook. It's just this bishop, dominant position right in the center of the board, pinning the pawn. The queen on f2 and the pawn on g6 are really enough. Of course, that move wasn't played in the game. It, this is the point that black resigned. But again, if, if queen c7, we could have rook h3. Instead of this rook sack, you could simply play to h4, and it's going to end much, much sooner. There's simply no saving this position. But this is as far as it got right here after the exchange on d5 and bishop takes d5. It is at this point that black simply resigned. So uh, that's all for this video. As always, I hope you got something out of it. Take care. Bye. And being aware of this pawn break, e5, will help us to identify the better placement for our light square bishop. Move 8, bishop e2, 